Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Good evening and welcome. I want to begin by extending my sincere thanks to the entire team here at Washington for this nice opportunity and to you all for taking the time out of your schedules this evening to learn about a topic very near and dear to me, the shoulder. I thought I'd begin by giving you a little bit of background information about where I come from. Uh, I'm a native of the Bay Area, uh, born and raised down in, in Los Gatos, California. And I uh, attended uh, high school down at Bellarmine Prep where water polo and swimming uh, were my sports. Uh, and uh, at that early stage, I learned a little bit about shoulder injuries and sports injuries. Moved up the peninsula to Stanford where I, I attended my undergraduate studies in biological sciences and then up a little further to San Francisco at UCSF where I went to medical school and did my residency training in orthopedic surgery. Following that I headed east to Boston uh, where I uh, did a fellowship in shoulder surgery and sports medicine and uh, then I had the opportunity to uh, move to Zurich where I learned a little bit more from one of the world's preeminent experts in shoulder disorders and then I circled back to the Bay Area where I uh, took my first uh, job at Kaiser uh, becoming a regional chief of shoulder surgery for all 17 hospitals and then finally moved over to academia where I spent the majority of my career in the full-time faculty there. But I'm excited to uh, very recently join the team at Dearborn Associates, John Dearborn, and Dr. Mishra, uh, where we have a very nice group and between the three of us over six years of experience uh, in orthopedic surgery where we can really focus on uh, specialized and personalized care uh, in a specialized setting. So it's been a really wonderful move for me in the last year. We have offices in Menlo Park and also in Fremont uh, and a brand new state-of-the-art surgery center which is going to be opening in the next couple of months at Redwood Shores, uh, very close to Oracle. Uh, so very excited about that. So my entire career has really been focused exclusively on the comprehensive treatment of shoulder disorders. I'm not one of those people that does a little bit of hip, a little bit of knee, a little bit of this and that. I've really been focused on what I consider to be the most interesting and intricate joint in the human body. Rotator cuff tears uh, are the number one problem that a, sh a shoulder specialist will see in their practice. And here we see Dr. Codman, who's credited with performing the first rotator cuff repair in Boston in 1909. Also writing really the encyclopedia of uh, the diagnosis and treatment at that time of some of the most more common shoulder disorders. Uh, so beyond rotator cuff tears, I've treated sports disorders in the professional athlete to the weekend warrior, instability problems, fractures and trauma, arthritis and joint replacement, uh, which has been very revolutionary over the past 20 years, and then finally revision problems. And the key is that I really try to incorporate both arthroscopic and open techniques, and each has its place even in 2020 in my practice. So sometimes it's something as simple as an injection as we see here, arthroscopic surgery, open surgery, it really depends on what we're treating. So my goals for this overview this evening are to uh, teach you all and talk a little bit about basic anatomy of the shoulder, how we as orthopedic specialists will evaluate patients, trying to define categories of disease, and there's really five buckets of pathologies that we will focus on tonight, treatment, and then finally looking ahead to current and future technology in the years to come. So let's start with shoulder anatomy, and here we're beginning with just beneath the skin, a right shoulder, we have the deltoid muscle, we have the pectoralis major muscle, which is right here. And as we dive a little deeper, we see some of the bony anatomy of the shoulder. We see the clavicle, which is the collarbone over here. And then we see the shoulder blade or the scapula. And then the arm bone or the humerus. And then four very important muscles which encapsulate the top of the humerus are called the rotator cuff. And I'm sure many of you have heard about this. The rotator cuff are four tendons that encircle the head and they provide strength for elevation of the arm, rotation, they stabilize the shoulder joint, and they provide strength overhead. Tears are very common as we get older, and they don't repair themselves over time. Deep to the rotator cuff, the next structure that's of importance is the shoulder capsule. 
and the shoulder capsule encloses the joint and, and houses the joint fluid beneath. And then inside of the capsule, we see the actual joint of the glenohumeral joint. The socket or, or the glenoid is encircled by a ring of tissue called the labrum. It deepens and widens to the shoulder uh, socket. And then deep to that, we see with, embedded within the capsule the glenohumeral ligaments. And then the long head of the biceps tendon, which is depicted in purple, which attaches to the very top of the glenoid. The shoulder joint uh, is actually comprised of four different joints. So the primary two are the glenohumeral, which is the ball in the socket, the scapulothoracic, which is the shoulder blade, which glides over the rib cage, and then two smaller joints called the acromioclavicular and the sternoclavicular joints. Your arc of motion of your shoulder is comprised two-thirds from the glenohumeral joint rotating and one-third from the shoulder blade gliding over the rib cage. So when we suffer from a condition such as arthritis, which affects the glenohumeral joint, a lot of the motion is coming with compensation from the shoulder blade gliding over the rib cage. So when we evaluate a patient, we always begin with these four approaches. We begin with a careful history where we gain important clues about a patient's symptoms, where things hurt, how they hurt, what hurts them more, what makes them better, a physical examination. Then we go on to imaging studies, x-rays, MRI, CAT scans most commonly, and then finally treatment. Now one of the important and very interesting things about the shoulder is the concept of referred pain patterns. So what that means is that not all pain is actually coming from the shoulder. Based on our embryological development, we can have referred pain patterns to the shoulder. So for example, heart disease or cardiac ischemia will frequently radiate pain to the left shoulder. Gallbladder disease, gallstones will frequently radiate pain to the right shoulder. Pathology of the cervical spine, slip discs or arthritis can radiate or refer pain to either shoulder. So that's why we're doctors first and orthopedic surgeons second. It's important to think about the entire picture because this can bear uh, fruit on what the cause of the problem might be. So beyond uh, these uh, referred patterns, uh, age is a very important clue to us because certain problems affect people of certain ages and it's not surprising. Instability problems such as dislocations and labrum tears affect the younger patients, arthritis, older patients obviously, fractures can affect patients of any age. So additional information we get from the history depends on what we're thinking about. So impingement, uh, which is a condition where patients have pain in the shoulder and upper arm with overhead motion reaching behind their back or across their body is frequently found in impingement syndrome. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. Rotator cuff disease, tears, inflammation, they are classic for causing pain at night. Pain which radiates down the upper arm to the elbow up in here pain turning over at night, pain with reaching. These are common uh, clues that we will hear from patients from their history with rotator cuff disease. Another condition which I'll talk about, frozen shoulders or adhesive capsulitis. This is a very severe, rapid onset of pain followed by stiffness, usually without any trauma or fall. And patients who have a history of diabetes or thyroid disease, female patients in their 40s, are the classic patient which will present with this temporary condition, thankfully. Arthritis is dull, constant pain. It's activity-related, stiffness, loss of motion, inability to reach to their head. It's something that we can clearly pick up on on x-rays. So that's the history. How about physical examination? Well, we begin by looking at our patients, looking at their surface anatomy, pushing on structures, checking range of motion, and then checking their strength, and then finally there are specialized tests which we will perform to delineate what the cause of the shoulder condition is. So this is an example of looking just at surface anatomy, and so I can see here the long head of the biceps tendon which lives right below the front of your shoulder, the clavicle, the AC joint here, the acromion, so there's many things that we can just push on that live right beneath the skin, other things we cannot. We then check range of motion as we see here, which is asymmetric in this individual with pretty bad arthritis. So beyond the exam, we then begin with imaging and every orthopedist will always start with plain x-rays. We don't get everything that we need from an MRI, for example. There are other elements that we measure and look for 
on plain routine x-rays. So this is looking from front to back. This is looking at the shoulder joint from top to bottom. And I want you all to compare the findings of that to this other x-ray to the lower right. And so these arrows depict differences in joint space. So the patient on the lower right has very advanced arthritis. And then on the upper panels, uh, well-preserved joint space. So these are things that we're looking at on x-rays, for example. This is a CAT scan. And so this gives us other more detailed three-dimensional information about the shoulder, not only the bony anatomy, but also the condition of the rotator cuff, which we see over here. So this is actually the rotator cuff muscle, and this is the scapula, or the shoulder blade. And so comparing what the muscle looks like here to where here it's a little bit more blackened and irregular, that's a patient that has a rotator cuff tear. The CT scan is also used, at least in the last five to seven years, uh, to interface with new software that enables us to virtually plan your surgery and to obtain certain targeting devices that enable us to perform surgery with greater precision. And this is really the current state in the future of what we do today. This is an MRI study. So this is for those of you that go into a long, narrow tube with many loud noises, it's a magnet. This provides very detailed information about the soft tissues around the shoulder. So this is looking at a rotator cuff tear over time. So based on our history, our physical examination, and our imaging, we are trying as shoulder specialists to place patients into these five categories of disease. And so I'm going to focus on each one of these uh, very briefly. So rotator cuff disease and impingement. Rotator cuff tears are very common. They affect 50% of the population aged older than 60 years of age. They uh, play a large part in a significant cost to our healthcare system, three to five billion dollars per year in medical costs and decreased productivity. And for those of us that have suffered from rotator cuff injuries, they can be very debilitating and the most common problem that I will see in my shoulder practice. How does the rotator cuff get injured? Well, I compare the rotator cuff tendons to, to the treads of, of a car tire. So with more miles as we get older, with more time, with more activities, or if you hit a pothole and puncture your tire or run over a nail, they can become thin, they can become torn. So age-related wear and tear is the most common. Uh, loss of blood flow to the tendon, such as uh, those who are tobacco users and smokers, very detrimental to tendons throughout the body. Repetitive motion, sport, work, life, or a single traumatic injury. And so the rotator cuff can become injured beginning with inflammation, impingement, and then it can progress to partial thickness tears. And then, as we see in the lower panel, a picture from arthroscopic surgery, a full thickness tear. And what's interesting about the rotator cuff, unlike cuts, unlike broken bones, they will not heal themselves back. They will always stay torn unless they're repaired surgically, but not all tears create the same degree of symptoms. So that's what makes rotator cuff tears very, very interesting. Impingement syndrome, which I spoke about before on history, is a common condition. It's also known as bursitis. It's inflammation of the bursa, which is a fluid-filled sac above the rotator cuff tendon. And it's pain with overhead motion, reaching behind one's back and night pain. As you can see here from this patient grimacing, uh, this is an impingement test that we will do in the uh, clinical office. Injections are commonly used into that bursa to help numb the area up and to help with diagnosis. Uh, you can also administer a steroid into this area and for many patients this can be a permanent solution, not just putting weeds over a fire. So this can provide a permanent solution sometime. And Here's a patient who had such a condition with an injection looking at her exam before and afterwards. So unlikely a tendon tear if the pain is resolved rapidly and strength is restored to normal. Sometimes it's not just inflammation, it's a bone spur. Here we see a, an x-ray of a sharp bone spur or spike which can develop and impinge on the rotator cuff and that can cause pain and that can be trimmed back with surgery if needed. So for impingement, uh, we usually will begin with a physical therapy program, rotator cuff strengthening, scapular strengthening, anti-inflammatory medicines. It's important to note that Tylenol, which is a very good pain reliever, does not reduce inflammation. So many of you who have tried Tylenol and have found that it doesn't work might benefit from a short course of an anti-inflammatory. Finally, injections and then surgery, as we see here, trimming back that 
spike of bone. That's called a subacromial decompression. And then removing the inflamed bursa with a laser device, we call that radiofrequency. That can be a very effective permanent treatment. Again, rotator cuff tears cannot repair themselves, as we see here. And then over time, the muscle that's attached to the tendon will degenerate and turn to fat. We call that fatty infiltration, and it's not reversible. So there will come a time when that muscle has completely turned into a fatty infiltrated tendon and not repairable. And so this is an example looking at a patient who had a rotator cuff tear over four years. And one thing that you can appreciate there is comparing the quantity of white fat there versus there has progressed and that's a bad sign which indicates to me when I'm meeting with patients before considering surgery that that is not going to be a repairable tendon but other things can be considered. And so this is an important concept that uh, why it's important to get evaluated sooner than later if you're suspecting a rotator cuff tear. You don't want to get to a, to a point where it's non-repairable if you can avoid it. And so this is looking under the microscope of what a normal muscle looks like to the left uh, and then to the right, that white fatty infiltrated muscle content in a chronic tear. Now rotator cuff repair has gone through a tremendous evolution in technology. And many of you have heard in the old days how painful rotator cuff repair surgery used to be. And partly that was because these were big incisions splitting through muscle like the deltoid to gain access to the rotator cuff very painful, slow recovery, and so now we have remarkable technology available to us with arthroscopic technique. So this depicts a camera which I'm inserting into a shoulder through these small portals, and this enables us to do something much less invasive, much more cosmetic. Here's a video of a typical rotator cuff tear, uh, and so uh, we are using devices called anchors which go into the bone, and so these enable uh, us to pass sutures from the anchor through the tendon to capture that tendon and to do this all looking at a camera and repair everything back to normal very elegantly and minimally invasively. This is outpatient surgery. Patients go home the same day and it's uh, really remarkable how much this has progressed. My experience and also that of our peer-reviewed literature results are excellent, uh, provided that the surgery goes as planned and that we have good synergy with patients following restrictions, using their sling, doing their exercises, and then working with skilled physical therapists. If all three of those elements are in good synergy and working together as a team, the results are excellent, they're durable, and it does take some time to heal, even with arthroscopic technique. Uh, we uh, require a sling for uh, several weeks, and then to get full function completely back, it tends to take up to six months. So what do we do if there uh, is a situation where tendons aren't repairable? Some tears can't be repaired at all. And we see here an example of a tendon tear which is not repairable. That will not pull back to where it should go. And so what this artist's rendition shows is a tendon transfer. So here uh, is a transfer of the latissimus, the lat muscle which can be used as a salvage procedure for an irreparable rotator cuff tear. And here is an example of a patient who had such a procedure. So I'm asking him here if he can raise his hand up. And that was what he was doing before surgery. And after the latissimus tendon transfer, he's able to restore normal function. So this is a complex procedure, not something that's commonly performed, uh, but in my practice, something that I will consider in select cases, if not an option. Now, what are some of the newer techniques that are around? So in approximately 2012, I was invited to be a visiting professor in Japan. And uh, I was uh, privileged to observe a up-and-coming orthopedic surgeon there who was developing a new technique. Now, in Japan, they don't have access to uh, certain of the technologies like the reverse shoulder replacement that we um, had here at that time. So there was a need to develop something different. So Dr. Mahata developed a technique called arthroscopic superior capsular reconstruction, uh, where a uh, graft uh, is tacked onto the edge of the non-repairable tendon and, and then attached 
uh, to the humerus. And so this is a, a picture from one of my surgeries using such a graft of cadaver tissue, which is inserted through these portals and then so sutured onto the residual tendon and humerus to achieve really remarkable results. And so things such as the latissimus dorsi transfer, which are much more invasive, have fallen a little bit out of favor because the arthroscopic procedures can produce newly equivalent results and can be done as an outpatient procedure. What are some other things that can happen to the rotator cuff beyond tears and inflammation and impingement? Well, some patients will deposit calcium into their rotator cuff. It's not clear why that is. It's not related to how much calcium you eat, uh, but thankfully these can go away over time and they can present very similarly to what impingement and rotator cuff tears look like. So these are some images that depict that. And then for the few patients that require surgery, we can decompress those kind of like a pimple. Uh, the consistency of the calcium is a little bit like toothpaste, uh, but we can take those away and relieve pain and occasionally we have to repair the rotator cuff as a result. So that's rotator cuff disease. What about instability? I think instability is one of the more complex and uh, elusive uh, areas of the shoulder. Patients will tell you that the shoulder feels unstable, it clicks, it puffs, uh, it's uneasy when they reach back like this. And then in extreme cases, as we see here, the shoulder, which already has a wide range of motion to begin with, can dislocate. Now, some people just have looseness of their joints. We call this ligamentous laxity. It's genetic. And as you can see here, it doesn't cause pain or symptoms. These are patients that don't necessarily require shoulder treatment, but they're very flexible. And they can do some very interesting party tricks if you ask them to. So these are in many cases, just collagen disorders or genetics that predispose people to laxity. Here's a patient who can dislocate his shoulder towards the back without pain. This is a young lady who can dislocate her shoulder towards the front. And so we have specialized tests. Uh, here's me when I was much younger, uh, performing tests to assess for different kinds of instability. Here's an MRI which shows a tear of the labrum, which we talked about in the back. And for most instability problems, a physical therapy program is really the first line treatment. And so we begin with strengthening of the rotator cuff, periscapular muscles. But if surgery is required, thankfully today, most things can be repaired and treated arthroscopically. There are still some conditions, especially in settings of bone loss, where open procedures are still required. So going back to our anatomy lesson, this is the labrum. And frequently the labrum, which can tear, is a source of instability of the shoulder. And so this is what we do arthroscopically. We put in anchors into the bone, and then we repair and, uh, the labrum and the capsule and tension the ligaments back to where they tore from. Here's a patient of mine looking with the arthroscope. We see a tear of that labrum torn away from the glenoid. And so what we're going to do is uh, pass sutures around that capsule and ligament and labrum and we're going to repair that back with anchors that go into the bone and then we tie it all back together and so that's what an arthroscopic bank cart repair looks like arthroscopically. So that's a typical operation we do for instability. What about frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis? Uh, we touched on it earlier. It's a very debilitating condition. Uh, it's characterized by the rapid acute onset of sharp pain. People will say it's like knives going through one shoulder followed by stiffness. And what is it caused by? It's caused by inflammation of the capsule in most, most cases of no real cause. And we call that idiopathic. And so this is what a normal shoulder capsule looks like. And to your right, you can appreciate a frozen shoulder capsule where it's contracted, it's inflamed. And that's what we see arthroscopically if we require treatment. It's something which is more common in women, uh, women in their 30s and 40s. And it's linked to diabetes and hypothyroidism or a family history of these conditions. So if your mom and your dad used to have these conditions but you don't, you can still have an increased risk of developing a frozen shoulder. Although it's temporary, it has a very characteristic course uh, and is characterized by the onset of pain followed by stiffness. Then the pain will taper down and go away and then the stiffness will get better last. And people will regain rotation outward first. The next arc of their motion to come back is elevation and the last to return is internal rotation reaching behind their back. And so this is what a classic frozen shoulder behaves like. In the early stages, at least in my practice, I find that physical therapy has a tendency to aggravate 
this condition, but later on it can be very effective in helping to restore motion once the pain has subsided. Thankfully, all cases really don't require surgery, but good supervision and accurate diagnosis and then some activity modification. So for those that like high impact sports like swimming or weightlifting, during the acute phase of a frozen shoulder, it's just gonna make matters worse. Oral anti-inflammatories can help with pain. Physical therapy, as we talked about, after the pain subsides. In some cases, a steroid injection into the joint fluid can help reduce pain. And what we wanna avoid is immobilizing the shoulder with a sling as much as possible. So if things kind of get to a point where they're not progressing as they normally do and pain is not improving and motion is not improving, then there is a surgery to consider. The key is to maintain that motion after the surgery. So this is an example of an arthroscopic capsular release. So I'm using this special device to release the adhesions, the scar tissue, the inflamed capsule, and it's remarkable that after these carefully performed procedures you can restore to nearly full motion immediately and the key is to maintain that after leaving the operating room with good physical therapy so we work very closely with our physical therapy colleagues to achieve these outcomes. Moving along to arthritis this is a big part of my practice as well. What is arthritis? Well arthritis is something that we all get it's loss of cartilage of any joint and so it's loss of the smooth cartilage that lines the two sides of the shoulder joint as we see here. That is the humerus and then the glenoid to your right. There are different forms of arthritis. There's primary osteoarthritis, which is just age, wear and tear, degenerative joint disease. There's secondary osteoarthritis, which is caused by other factors like trauma or tears of the rotator cuff. And uh, there is arthritis that's caused by crystals such as gout, uh, and then finally, inflammatory arthritis conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. These can all cause loss of cartilage of varying degrees. Now, primary degenerative joint disease has certain features on x-ray. There are bone spurs, as we see here, cysts, thickening of bone behind the cartilage surface, joint space narrowing. And that's characteristic of degenerative joint disease. Now, other forms of arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic, which are inflammatory, cause a different pattern on x-rays. There's loss of bone. There is a more kind of concentric erosion of the joint space, not so many bone spurs. And so as we see here on this CAT scan, these are different challenges that we face if we're considering a joint replacement because some of the bone is lost. Rotator cuff tearing is common. And here we see over time the humerus migrating up because the rotator cuff tendons have been deficient for a very long time. Thankfully, our pharmaceutical colleagues have developed better drugs, and so the medical management of these disorders has improved over time. And so we don't see some of the very severe destructive changes in bone that we used to see. However, uh, we still, despite these uh, efforts with DMARDs or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, Sometimes an orthopedic reconstruction is still required. What about other forms of arthritis? This is osteonecrosis, so steroid use, excessive alcohol, some trauma can lead to collapse of the humeral head, destruction of cartilage as we see here. So it's a different form of arthritis. And how do we approach arthritis? Well, as with many things, we begin with anti-inflammatories, therapy, activity modification. For some of the more advanced stages of arthritis, injections have not been very effective, and this includes not only steroid, but things like Synvisc or Visco supplements or stem cells. And so for some of the more minor cases, if some of these conservative non-surgical methods haven't worked, in more mild or moderate cases of arthritis, we can consider arthroscopic surgery. In more severe cases, joint replacement is really the only way to go. So this is again an arthroscopic patient who we are considering in a patient such as this who has arthritis but is not ready to consider joint surface replacement because they want to do heavy lifting, contact sports. And so for some of these patients or patients who are not interested in joint replacement or they're very sick patients who want a faster recovery, they're going to consider something arthroscopic. But the so-called clean-out procedure or comprehensive arthroscopic management of shoulder arthritis leads to less predictable outcomes and less durable outcomes than joint replacement. 
Here's a nice lady who I treated years ago who was a paraplegic, so she required her arms for a lot of weight bearing, and so that can be one of the risk factors for shoulder joint replacement. And so she wanted to keep swimming and not have restrictions, so we did a clean out removing loose bodies and arthritis and, and bone spurs, and she did well with that procedure as we see here. Here's a young man who uh, was an anabolic steroid user, unfortunately developed osteonecrosis of the shoulder, and so he was someone interested in one of the less invasive partial resurfacing replacements that I was performing at that time. And so this was something that allowed him to return to weightlifting and not have any activity restrictions. So total shoulder replacement, which involves replacing not only the ball but the socket with synthetic parts, is a very predictable, very durable operation. It's indicated for patients with loss of function that is not responsive to conservative measures caused by arthritis. And a traditional shoulder replacement requires an intact rotator cuff. And the reason for that is if you just resurface the surfaces without an intact rotator cuff, you can have loading of the plastic, which is cemented, and that can lead to early loosening and failure of the procedure. That's called a rocking horse phenomenon. Now, remarkably, the first shoulder replacement was performed in 1893, and this was in a patient with tuberculosis, and the great French surgeon, uh, Jules Emile Payon, performed this. It unfortunately developed an infection. We didn't have sterile technique in those times or antibiotics, and it needed to be removed six months later. Now, modern joint replacement really began with uh, the developments in the hip uh, with some of the pioneering work of Sir John Charnley in, uh, in England, and some of those concepts trickle down to modern-day shoulder arthroplasty, pioneered much by Dr. Charles Neer, and the first shoulder replacement being performed in 1951. So it's been around for nearly 70 years and getting better and better by the day. We have a variety of options uh, which are stemmed or short stem or stemless. These are less invasive. Those are anatomic procedures. And then the lower right here, we see a reverse replacement where the ball and the socket are reversed. This is something that I brought back from Switzerland uh, in the mid-2000s, and this helps to address some complex problems of the shoulder. Here's a patient of mine who underwent bilateral total shoulder replacements, and they did a feature article on him on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle in 2005, and uh, this, uh, or actually 2010. And uh, one of the things they wanted to focus on was that although hip and knee joint replacement is more common and very effective, shoulder joint replacements perform well, can perform equally well, and it's the fastest growing segment of joint replacement. Here's a typical patient with arthritis of the shoulder. He's 65. He has loss of motion and pain. We looked at his x-rays earlier, as we see here. And so we take measurements and calculations to achieve uh, what we're going to do with surgery. This is an animation that depicts how we perform a shoulder replacement. We have to actually release one of the rotator cuff tendons in the front, the subscapularis, to gain access into the joint. And so after we do that, we will remove the arthritis and then we will pass sutures for later repair of that rotator cuff tendon, and then we implant our prosthesis, as we see here. We resurface the glenoid, which is the socket, and then we repair everything back down. So that is... Uh, an artist's rendition of what a typical shoulder replacement will look like. So this is the implant, and this is the final result. Pain-free, nearly full motion, and very happy. Now, I've had the opportunity to be a principal investigator in three FDA clinical trials during my time at Stanford looking at stemless shoulder replacements. So these are less invasive implants. They've been around for at least 15 years worldwide, and they're less invasive. They're bone-preserving and they enable people to recover more quickly with less post-operative pain and in, in most cases can be performed as an outpatient procedure which is quite remarkable. I'm also proud to have brought over to Washington Hospital the first US FDA clinical trial of a stemless reverse shoulder replacement. So we're enrolling patients as we speak and I foresee that this will be another dramatic uh, evolution in how we perform reverse shoulder replacement in the years to come. So this is a patient with arthritis who underwent shoulder stemless replacement, and he did very, very well uh, going back uh, to 2013. 
So what about reverse replacement? Reverse replacement I touched on earlier is where the ball and the socket are reversed. It is a, a concept which initially uh, was thought to be crazy, uh, but it was well studied. And what it basically does is it addresses a patient with a non-functional rotator cuff by giving a mechanical advantage to the deltoid muscle, the big muscle over the front of the shoulder and the side that we talked about earlier. So by changing the evolution and the mechanics of the shoulder, we can address a broader spectrum of shoulder conditions. I performed my first reverse procedure in, in Switzerland in February of 2004. At that time, uh, it was not yet available in the U.S., and so this was introduced to my uh, patients uh, at Kaiser and, and uh, later on in that year. And this is one area that I consider myself to be really an expert. Uh, and it's been a remarkable godsend for us to treat shoulder conditions. When do we consider the reverse? In patients with rotator cuff tears that are not repairable with arthritis, some fractures in old, older people, and some revision problems. So here's a patient who has arthritis with rotator cuff tearing. And so this is what a reverse shoulder looks like in a patient who's doing very, very well. Here's a patient who was a little elderly with a very complex fracture. I was concerned about bone quality, and so fixing this with a plate and screws was not ideal, and a reverse replacement performed better and uh, solved that problem, thankfully. We talked about virtual medicine and uh, some of this remarkable technology. Uh, this is a video, a short video showing a 3D printed model with an intraoperative guide. And this just enables the surgeon to translate with more accuracy what our surgical plan is to the patient. And these methods have only been available for about three years or so. We're now working on augmented reality, robotic assistance. It's really amazing what is going to happen in the years to come with evolution and technique. Other things that we're working on down the horizon, minimally invasive shoulder replacement, doing things completely arthroscopically. Uh, I think this is several years away, but we're working on perhaps the day when we don't even have to open the shoulder at all and place the implants in like that. Finally, fractures, uh, other fractures. Most shoulder fractures, thankfully, don't require surgery. We consider age of the patient, the type of fracture, bone quality, and activity demands. And so here's a patient who was a pharmacist who sustained a fall while snowboarding uh, and sustained this fracture of the humerus, which we see here. And based on the alignment, I elected to treat this without surgery, so a sling, weight bearing, and activity restrictions. And so over time, the bone healed and it remodeled. And then with the good work of our, our colleagues in physical therapy, we were able to restore that back to normal. Here's a different patient, 70-year-old uh, young uh, lady who had a fall and dislocated and fractured her shoulder. So the ER doctors had to put it back in, and then we had to wait for that fracture to heal and it went on to do just fine. Here's a different scenario. Here's a professional rugby player that I took care of years ago. Very severe, multi-part, proximal humerus fracture. And so in a younger patient with good bone, we would prefer to fix the fragments. And so this is what we call a locking plate, uh, which is placed to an open incision with screws to restore normal anatomy and enable people to go back without restrictions. We have lots of uh, mountain and road bikers in our uh, lovely Bay Area. Here's a 44-year-old male, fell on his road bike, sustained this collarbone or clavicle fracture. This was very displaced. And so although some of these can be treated without surgery, this one did better by restoring normal anatomy. So where are things going in the future? I think augmented and virtual reality is currently being studied and evaluated. Robotic assistant with surgery, although at the end of the day, I think with orthopedics, we will always need skilled hands uh, with perhaps robotic assistance, not replacement. Uh, stem cells, tissue engineering growth factors, I think these are all things that are on the horizon and very exciting. So in summary, the shoulder is a very intricate, the most complex joint in the body. A variety of problems, which I've touched on here, are possible, but thankfully, many of these can be treated Without surgery and some that do require surgery, there are minimally invasive options on the table for us to consider. What's most exciting is the state of technology today and what lies ahead. And so I'm very, very thrilled to be a part of this and I look forward to hopefully meeting some of you that need my help in the uh, days and years to come. Thank you for your attention. We'll take a couple of questions for Dr. Castores. Dr. Castores, is it safe to have elective surgery such as a sh shoulder surgery during this COVID pandemic? 
So I think it's been a, a tremendous evolution from the time in early March where we completely shut down elective surgery uh, countrywide to now developing safe methods to uh, live in the new era that we live in. So we have a variety of steps that we take to ensure patient safety. Uh, patients are required to be COVID tested before they come to the hospital. Uh, now three days before an elective procedure. Uh, staff uh, is uh, routinely screened and tested as well. And uh, we have extra measures for sterilizing surfaces, rooms, materials. But most importantly, what's one of the things that's unique to this uh, setting here is we have a completely separate unit, uh, the Center for Joint Replacement, uh, which uh, houses specialized nursing, therapists, and uh, the patients of, uh, of, my, of my practice and Dr. Dearborn's, uh, really away from patients who are at risk uh, of exposure to COVID. So I'm thankful and pleased that we have a safe environment for operating uh, in the midst of COVID. Great, thank you for that. Another question. I have mild scoliosis and have trouble th uh, and having throbbing pain in my shoulder along with a clicking after a heavy workout um, from CrossFit. It lasts about two to three days after, and I'm pretty mindful about the repetitive emotion and how much weight I put on the bar, but it's very frustrating. Is this due to scoliosis or should I see a specialist? Well, it sounds like you need to see a specialist. And the reason for that is uh, we talked during my presentation about referred pain versus pain coming from the shoulder. <clears throat> so those are gonna be delineated with a good exam uh, and sometimes imaging. So it's possible that the scoliosis is irritating nerves, which is referring pain to the shoulder. And it's also possible that, uh, that you may be developing some other pathology in the shoulder from your CrossFit training or weightlifting or wear and tear over the years. Uh, so that can be ruled out uh, in the hands of a good shoulder specialist. Okay, next question. I have been suffering from shoulder pain for about three years. Um, I'm not into any activities. It's just been ongoing. Um, when should I see a specialist or should I see my primary care? Well, I think if it's something that's been going on for several years, uh, I think the first thing is, you know, what's your age? Uh, what are some of the activities that you do? Um, and uh, if it's kind of a low grade pain, uh, it's always a, not a bad idea to begin with a primary care doctor if you choose. Uh, but if you want to get right to the nitty gritty, uh, it's perhaps uh, more useful to go right to someone that knows exactly what to look for. Uh, so uh, we, for example, can accept patients without a referral from another doctor, happy to do so. Uh, but we also are thankfully will accept patients who have uh, been seen by a primary care doctor first, maybe receive therapy or injections, and maybe just take the baton and run with it or redirect things if they're not moving in the right direction. That actually leads to the next question. Do I need a referral to schedule an appointment at your office? No. And every, every system is a little bit different. We will accept referrals directly from patients. Uh, many of my patients find me and seek me out uh, just by virtue of word of mouth or their friends or what they've heard about or the internet. So they can directly come and see me in the clinic. Okay, next question. Um, this is actually, I, sorry, next question, here we go. Is there anything that I should do before surgery? Um, should I do some sort of exercises or should I go to physical therapy before or after surgery for my shoulder pain? So the concept of physical therapy before surgery for the shoulder or prehab as some people call it has never been found to be uh, helpful or effective. Uh, and if anything, the way insurance companies work today, it's sometimes helpful to save those therapy visits for after surgery, where after the surgery, physical therapy is really critical uh, and a common part of any operation that I do. Working with a, with a skilled expert in physical therapy and then doing a home program in addition to that. Next question, is there anything that I should do to prevent shoulder injury or um, where I would have to avoid having surgery in my later years. I'm only 29 um, and just trying to get into um, uh, heavy lifting. 
Yeah, so a lot of what happens to any joint in the shoulder in particular is, uh, is predetermined based on your genetics. You know, some people based on how they're born, how their anatomy is structured, are predisposed to developing certain conditions versus others. So that's the bony anatomy, we talked about collagen, we talked about rotator cuff. Uh, you know, then there's the environmental things that can come into play. So, you know, things like tobacco use and smoking are not ideal. Heavy alcohol use, not ideal. And I'm a fan of, you know, maintaining activity and being fit, but also cross-training. So, you know, learning how, if you're a, if you're a weightlifter, proper technique, um, you know, diversifying the types of exercises that you're doing. Uh, because over time, if you're doing one thing heavy, repetitively, over and over and over again, chances are things are going to accelerate arthritis and other conditions, tearing of tendons and labrum, but thankfully they can be treated in most cases. So live your life, be reasonable, cross-train, eat healthy, uh, and um, there's always a solution if needed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Castores. <music>